tonight. I'm Trent Peters Clark. Behind the camera is Austin Salome, and we're both grad students in the Hume Lab, and today we'll be walking through how to calibrate the mass spectrometer. Uh, just for point of reference, we'll be working with a thermo fusion lumos mass spectrometer, so it's a tri-bit instrument. And if we pan over here, we can show the instrument schematic. So this is our uh, instrument source. There's a bent flatipole. We've got a quadrupole mass filter that can filter out ions based on their mass to charge ratio. There's an orbitrap mass detector and an ion trap mass detector that can also perform uh, mass filtering. So if we just go ahead and open up our tune page, this is where we'll be performing the uh, calibrations and looking at the data. We'll just start uh, that collecting. I'll come over here and grab this uh, flex mix, which is just a concoction of small metabolites, a small four amino acid peptide, and, uh, and a polymer of various lengths so that we can get uh, basically masses across the mass spectrum for uh, mass analyses and ion optics. Go ahead and load up some of this solution directly infused into the mass spectrometer. And I'll flow that at just three microliters a minute. So if I turn on the syringe cone, I'll need to prime it first a few times just to get rid of any air bubbles in there. But you can see ions are already starting to come through. Prime it once more. So this higher mass range up here is where we're seeing that polymer of 1022, 1122, all the way up to 1922 uh, Daltons. This 524 is just a 4 amino acid long peptide MRFA, and uh, this is the doubly charged form of it, and then there's things like caffeine down in the low mass range. And if we turn on our Orbitrap mass detection, we can actually detect uh, charge states. So we see a lot of these things are just charge state of one, and we can open up our calibration pan here. So within this calibration pan, uh, we'll be mostly interested in positive mode analyses today. We can perform a CalMix evaluation, so uh, evaluating how pure our uh, solution is, if there's any contamination there, or if there's um, kind of uh, too bad of mass shifts to, uh, to pass that evaluation, more or less. Uh, there's also spray stability, which is important to perform just to ensure that there's not a lot of intensity drift or um, sporadic intensity throughout the course of our evaluations that could uh, later look like uh, poor ion optics or ion transfers to various parts of the mass spectrometer. And we'll perform a check only for these parameters uh, so that if they do fail, uh, it'll just inform us that they failed and won't actually go through and optimize those parameters at this point. So within, so right now we're flowing, we're electrospraying in the positive mode, uh, all these analytes at three microliters per minute. And we're going to look at, uh, in the positive mode, the ion optics. So that is uh, shuttling ions, positive uh, cations through the mass spectrometer. Uh, and seeing how those transfer efficiencies look, uh, and if we need to optimize those by changing the DC offset or the, the voltage gate into or out of one section of the mass spectrometer. Then we'll look at the ion trap, uh, at both as a filter and a detector. We'll look at the quadrupole mass filter and transmission, and then we'll look at the orbit trap mass analyzer. So, if we just select one of these ion optics to check, such as the IRM to ion trap. So the IRM is the ion routing multiple. So if we come back here to our schematic, uh, this is the ion routing multiple right here. So this is uh, where higher energy collisional dissociation would occur. Um, and we're gonna be looking at how transfers of cations go from the IRM to the ion trap and perform kind of a ping-ponging uh, procession of that back and forth just to get a, uh, an accurate measure of transfer efficiencies. 
So first they did that CalMix evaluation, that passed. Now it's looking at our uh, signal stability. As long as it's under a 15% RSD, it'll pass and looks fairly stable right now. And now we're performing our uh, transfer efficiencies. And so on the x-axis, uh, I'll discard this report for now, uh, but you can see it's increasing the number of transfers back and forth from the ion routing multiple to the uh, ion trap up to 17 times. And so if I pull up our schematic just once more, uh, it's basically going from here to here uh, and then scanning it out, looking at that intensity of all the various ions and then going back and forth twice, reading it out three times, etc. And so that's why these curves are kind of dropping off over time is because uh, the more transfers you do, the uh, lower intensity you're going to see. But overall, we're getting above 95% or so of efficiency. So that, uh, that pass, because all we need is a 70%. But I'll point out that you could be hovering around 72% transfer efficiency and getting a lot fewer ion flux into the ion trap, and it would still pass your calibration, but this is one reason why um, you know, actively monitoring these calibrations is nice, uh, just ensuring that you're getting the maximum performance out of your mass spectrometer. Uh, so a lot of these other uh, ion optics parameters here are going to be similar in that they're going to be ping-ponging back and forth from one section of the mass spec to the to the next um, or from in this case the source to the IRM just the front of the mass spec to the IRM um, just to see exactly where we're lacking or where we can improve. If I go ahead and minimize this ion optics pan another type of uh, Another type of calibration that we can perform is on our electron multipliers. And so if you're looking at your data and you're saying, oh, my signals are really low, um, why could this be? Well, it could be that you're not transferring ions very uh, readily through the mass spec, but it could also be that your electron multiplier needs to be recalibrated. So uh, if we go ahead and start this evaluation, Again, it'll check our count mix, that looks good. It'll check our signal stability and ensure that that's good before it proceeds to our evaluation. And then it'll iterate through various uh, voltages of the electron multiplier to see uh, exactly what voltage needs to be set. So here it's going after this negative 1851.9, uh, and it'll keep going up and up, and basically the higher voltage you have, the higher signal you'll see, um, but there's a sweet spot that um, the mass spectrometer will arrive at. And for the sake of time, we'll just go ahead and uh, move on to the next um, to the next uh, calibration. But you can see that this one passed with its current settings, not requiring a. a a calibration to a higher uh, multiplier voltage. But over time, your multipliers will uh, cause higher and higher voltages just as that uh, surface material comes off and, um, and then eventually they will need to be replaced. Um, all right, so now if we look at some things like our ion trap mass resolution, um, so there are five different scan settings you can perform uh, for your uh, for ion trap MS2s or uh, tandem mass spectra. So for let's say normal and rapid mode, we're going to be interested in today. For example, we can go ahead and uh, check the current calibrations on those two settings, uh, normal and rapid. And so, uh, and turbo being the fastest would have the, uh, the widest tolerance. Um, rapid would be a little bit faster of a scan than. Uh, normal, and so you're giving up a bit of resolution, but again, you're getting a faster scan. So there's benefits to all five scan types, really. So it's looking at our mass error versus the mass to charge ratio, and you can see it's already exceeded the 0.2 Dalton. Uh, observed minus theoretical threshold, and so that's going to fail. If we pan over to the right, we'll see that it's looking at the peak width versus massive charge. 
now that it's disappeared, but it's doing the same thing now for our rapid scan mode. And it, it needs to fall within a, uh, a window as well in order to pass that. So, so I'll discard this report, but you can see that there's a nice linearity to this. So I predict we'll be able to calibrate this, but um, I'll go ahead and uncheck this check only box. So now it'll still perform our count mix evaluation. It'll ensure our spray stability um, is uh, that our spray is stable, but then it will uh, it will actually go ahead and calibrate those two uh, ion trap mass uh, scan rates. So it's monitoring our 1321 peak of that polymer to ensure that we've got good uh, signal stability. Now it's going through various uh, peaks to, uh, to see what the mass error is uh, versus the uh, you know versus the theoretical peak. So again, it did this check and it's it's off. So now it'll iterate through a, a calibration via other parameters. Um, and now it passed. So normal mode's good to go. We, uh, we're proceeding with a, uh, an LCMS method that was using normal node or uh, we're infusing some peptide or protein solution and we wanted to do tandem mass spectra with normal node as the, uh, the MS2 detector. And then we could go ahead and proceed with that at this point. Um, and rapid mode passed as well. So we were both able to get both uh, normal and rapid modes of the ion trap MS2 detection to pass, so that's good. Um, and uh, you can see that our mass error is now pretty tight around uh, zero, so that's ideal. We look at next our quadrupole transmission. So our quadrupole again is, uh, is just this mass filter here in, uh, near the front of the instrument. So a lot of things are going to be coming through this quadrupole, and we want to separate out uh, things based on mass to charge, so that we can uh, either fragment those things or um, detect their their intact mass. But oftentimes we uh, we get more than we bargained for, and so we want to make sure that transmission is uh, is pretty pure, and we're not filtering out the things that we actually intend to transmit to the rest of the ion trap. So I'm going to recheck this check only box so that we're just evaluating the current status of quadrupole transmission and I'll go ahead and start that evaluation. Again it's just looking at this 1321.9 peak uh, to see how our signal stability looks and it's still performing well. And so now it's going after this 524 peak, this MRFO peptide, to see over time um, across M over Z values how, how is percent transmission. And so we're getting this nice peak that, um, that basically peaks around uh, 31, 32 percent. So it's really not the highest uh, transmission. I'd like to see it be uh, a bit higher than that. Um, and then we can also see the various isotopes of uh, uh, of the MRFA peptide. So this is, would be plus one C13 and plus two C13s. Um, all right. Um, so that could, def could definitely be calibrated. It did pass the cal uh, it did pass the calibration evaluation. Um, but for uh, for time's sake, I'll just go ahead and move on to the Orbitrap. And we'll look at our Orbitrap masses. We typically like to be within two ppm during our Orbitrap. Um, mass analysis um, cal calibration, we like to be within 2 ppm, and, and we'll go ahead and check the current status of the orbit trap to see if that's the case. So you can see it's looking at mass accuracy here. Uh, in ppm, and it's going through various different AGC targets, various uh, ion count targets. So right now it's doing 5e5 or 500,000 uh, targets. Uh, that's the number of charges within the uh, within the orbit trap at that time. 
and our PPM or our mass accuracy uh, error is uh, is more than 10 ppm, so it's pretty far off. So we should definitely go ahead and calibrate that. We did just open up this instrument and had to bake it out, so it makes sense that this is a uh, that this needs to be calibrated as the orb trap operates at a very low pressure, and so when it's open up to atmosphere, when the instrument's open up to atmosphere, um, it needs to be baked out afterward, and um, we're just ensuring now that um, before our next run, we'll go ahead and do really nice, pre uh, precise masses. So it's, again, it's just going through these various, uh, now it's doing 100,000, 200,000, and 500,000 targets. And then, I don't know, my mistake, I'll have to, I get the check only again. So now, uh, if we do the actual calibration, then it will actually try to change how, uh, how masses are detected such that we can get more precise values. And presuming that this uh, step works and we're able to calibrate the mass uh, of the orbit trap, then we can go ahead and move on to setting up a method. Um, and, uh, well, we'd like to see all the other ion optics and things like that as well. Um, but, uh, but presuming that everything looks good, we can go ahead and move on to uh, setting up a method. And, uh, yeah. Just creating this nice curve of uh, EPM deviation over the, um, the AGC or the predicted ion. Thing. Uh, you can see that I was discarding those reports, but it, uh, we are able to save those uh, and look at them later if they pass or fail. And so in this case, we are doing the HCD to linear trap transfer. So that's the very first ion transfer uh, we did today. And for all of these various uh, molecules from 195, so our uh, caffeine molecule, up to these various 1022, 1122, and et cetera um, polymers, we can see how they transferred um, from the HCD cell or the ion routing multiple, same uh, thing with a different name, to the linear ion trap uh, across various transfers. So from one transfer, um, you know, for example, you're seeing uh, this purple ion, 1422, we saw an intensity of above 5,000. After three transfers, it was down to 5,000. It keeps going down. And based on that trajectory, uh, the instrument gives it a, uh, a, a efficiency value. And so in this case, 1422 showed up right about 95% uh, efficiency. So that's pretty nice. That's about where we like to see it, uh, at or above 95%. Um, and there are many other uh, calibrations, but uh, for the sake of time, that's where we'll stop it. So thanks for your time, and uh, yeah, hope you enjoyed it.